Hello and welcome to the last word on Spurs, your award-winning Tottenham Hotspur podcast. We are back, 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 ahead of a big, big week for Tottenham Hotspur, of course, in the Premier League as we return back to action with Brighton to come on the weekend. <laughs> Sorry, is this so unprofessional for you? You know what? It's always when the big, big stars turn up. Yeah, team crackers! <laughs> <laughs> You know what? We've gone gold. I don't know what Crackers has done there in the background there. He went full on gold. I'll tell you what, that was literally gold comedy. That really, really was. <laughs> what an unprofessional start to the show. If you're listening to us for the first time, you can... Crackers is in the downstairs room having gone through the ceiling. <laughs> Hang on. I'm just, I'm just trying to prop the phone up against two bottles of Creed and a bottle of, like, tobacco, I think. On my phone now. The moment you went live, Rick, that phone sat there for about <laughs> twenty minutes, and the moment you went live, it fell off. Now, if that's not important for the show to come, I don't know what is. Like I said to you, get that scrabble back out, put it under there, put the lobby to the side. We'll be absolutely fine. What are you worried about? What are you worried about? Look, we are oh, bringing you a very, very I'm... special show. <laughs> on this last one on Spurs, a very, very special guest. We've waited all through the um, of January to bring him on to the very, very end. I'm joined by Jason. I'm joined by Cracks. I'm joined by a very special guest. We have gone gold. We'd like to welcome back Tottenham Hotspur correspondent, Alistair Gold on last one on Spurs. Al, lovely to have you here. Sorry about that introduction. How are you? <laughs> all right. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. Loving the carnage already. Like Cracker said, I think it's pretty much going to uh, give her a uh, foresight into what's probably to come this show. But we'll enjoy ourselves, whatever. Absolutely. You know, just as things are fairly calm at Spurs, Cracks decides to go through the ceiling. So um, it's just another normal episode of last one at Spurs, really. I mean, Jason, the most calmest man in the building there. Jace, how are you? you OK? Started on time? Not too bad, mate. I believe we also need a gas boiler engineer as well for the show. <laughs> you know what? Any in the vicinity of Ali's house, can they get round and fix his gas boiler? <laughs> for, the, for Ali's sake, I won't give out his private address. Not that I have his private address, but for the sake of a queue at the door trying to fix the boiler, I think he'll safely wait till tomorrow morning. Now there will be a queue waiting for Ali, trying to get his personal address to go around there. Um, look, right. on this show, of course, we'll be having a brief roundup of where we were in terms of the January window. Well, of course, Jason's favourite subject, I must just add on that point. We'll be discussing some of the players that are heavily the standout features of Spurs' season. We'll be discussing, of course, your questions you've had in, over 50, 60 questions for Ali to try and answer. Don't worry, Al, not all 50 and 60 are coming your way. We've narrowed them down to a reasonable amount of 30, 40. Joking. <laughs> <laughs> and we're, of course, looking forward to Brighton to come on the weekend. Now, look, I'll be honest with you. It's been one of those shows where beforehand we've had about Ali's boiler. We've had a couple of absentees that have come in very, very late. Uh, firstly, I have to give an apology out. Lee McQueen, the crazy instructor runner of this crazy epic train. So Maka has been, as you know, grafting all the time. He's out in Farnborough, I believe, at the moment where traffic has haunted him. It's the first time cracks ha traffic's haunted Maka, right? Ever heard of that before? No, so, if he cared, he'd be here, Rick. That's all I can say. If he was proper Tottenham, he'd make it. Oh, no, so, it's a disgrace, I'm sorry, really. the man's got a Tesla. They drive their cells. Why don't you get his <laughs> Apple head, headset on and do the show? Because the dr car drives itself. No, I'm not having that. Apart from Macca, you're fired. <laughs> you can't do it because he hasn't been into the makeup room yet, mate. <laughs> 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 Just to get in cruise control, for God's sake, and put the bloody webcam up. What's the problem with that guy? <laughs> Listen, we wish Maka a speedy recovery. I say speedy recovery. He's, he's all right, by the way. You know, so he's just on his way back home with us very, very soon. And Ricky Norwood, bless his heart. Ricky was meant to be with us tonight. And as those know out there, we're avidly voting for Ricky in Dancing on Ice, where, yeah, he's still there doing really well. Didn't do a Spurs, didn't crash out in the first round. He's hoping to go all the way to the final but not bottle it and actually get over a cup final, fingers crossed. Now, Ricky, bless him, has sent us over a nice message for all of our viewers and listeners, which I'm going to play right now. This is Ricky's message to everybody, of course, who can't be with us tonight. Ricky, over to you, my man. Hello, all you beautiful people from Last Word on Spurs. I'm sorry I can't be there tonight. Ali, I'm sorry. Guys, Ricky, all of the gang, I'm sorry I can't be there tonight, but it's just... I'm training until late and I won't get home until way, way late. So um, it, it is Ryan Thomas in the background there. Oh, Ricky, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so we're just here training, my friends, and uh, just want to send you loads and loads of love, all right? Um, yes, so this week is musicals week and there's a lot going on. This routine is a lot harder 
than any other routine that I've done so far. But that's what they keep doing in this show. They just keep pushing. They just keep pushing you and they keep pushing you. Um, but it's going to be amazing. Hopefully, if we can get it together, it will be really, really lovely. Um, I've got lifts in it. I've got turns in it. I've got solo skating in it. So there's a lot going on. So I just wanted to thank all of you guys at Last World on Spurs and all of the fans for supporting and for voting and for just being there. And also to Ali Gold and all of the family, thank you for supporting. Thank you for your votes and thank you for all the love as well, guys. Um, I miss you guys. I miss talking about Tottenham, but you know, we got to go to work, right? Um, also, big happy birthday to Cliff Jones. Big happy birthday to Cliff Jones, the man, the myth, the legend. Um, so yes, I hope he's having a fantastic day. Um, about Tottenham, we're having a great season, all right? From where we was to where we are, we're in a good place. And there's good things happening. And not only do the players know that there's good things happening, but those that want to come to the club know that there's something special happening. So listen, all you fans out there, just keep supporting them. Keep doing what you normally do. Win, lose or draw, home and away. You guys are amazing. Shout out and come on you Spurs. There you go. The wonderful Ricky J. Norwood. And as Jason proudly there in the background says, the hashtag vote Norwood. Vote Norwood. Right. There you go. Ricky J. Norwood, bless him. We'll have him back on here very, very soon. Rick, as well as Lee McQueen. Go on, Craig. Rick, go on, can I just say that a lot of people will probably go, oh, do you know what? Ricky Norwood, he's probably like that. If you met him in real life, he'd be horrendous. He's just being nice. Do you know what? He is, as you know, Rick, the, the nicest man you could meet. He really, really is a top, top lad. Like, you know, off screen, on screen, he is the nicest guy. So, uh, yeah, I really hope he goes far in the comp. Amen. Oh, yes, yeah, so I totally agree, Cracks. Echo those thoughts 100%. Now, Al, you know, like, like to, to ease you in gently here on Last Word on Spurs. So, um, this is just a message from Kanat Anson, one of our listeners, one of our valuable listeners, who says, Ali, Love your show. Can you please ask Ad if you can instruct Romero to look for the pass to his right? He never <laughs> seems to see Poro or Kalisevsky in a good position and tell Ad they should be shooting more. All right, Al? That's, that's <laughs> from that's from Canuck there. So um, when you see Ad on Friday, I mean, look, he's a fairly calm guy, as we've seen. Just whisper that in his ear. I'm sure that goes down fairly well, right? Oh, he loves a whisper in his ear. Yeah, he's just that kind of guy. He loves a, just, you know, a little soft whisper in his ear. Yeah, massive fan of that. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'll squeeze that in somewhere in the press there, yeah. There you go, Canuck. Don't say we didn't ask Ali for that one for you. Right, Rick, easy. Go on, Rick, do you know the problem is, because he's got Van der Ven to the left of him, yeah, he keeps passing to the Dutch upon the left-hand side. That's the problem. <laughs> You're going early. You're going too early. You just started. You've got to speed this up. Listen, <laughs> Poor old Ali's like, well, I'm going to jokes. I did tell Ali, look, it might rival Guesty and Guess Golden Guest. This might do crack them on gold. <laughs> it's not a way to go. But it's early days here. We've got to be careful with what we might do to this show. But we've got to set the bar fairly low, cracks to begin with, because we go too high. We fly off the blocks. Um, our nice easy one to begin with here, a, a question that's come in. Uh, St. Angelos, God, there you go. What a name that is. St. Angelos says, Ali, what's the biggest change at Tottenham you've seen as a reporter since Ange has come through the door? People smiling. <laughs> Honestly, people are happy. That's weird in itself. Honestly, that club towards the end of last season, wow. It was, honestly, you're uh, like out of wake, essentially. It was just horrendous. Um, to be fair, Ryan Mason started to turn it around a little bit. I think he brought people together. But under Ange, it's just, it kind of feels like a little bit way back, a certain manager who's obviously now at Chelsea um, got the place being a bit of a family. And that's what it feels like again. You can feel that just among the club staff. You talk to the coaches, the academy. They all feel like they're part of something bigger now, whereas the academy beforehand were like just felt like the most separated thing, you know, from Conte. I don't think. Well, I think we know about the academy and Conte and the under twenty ones and things like that. So I won't go all of that old ground. But yeah, just smiles and happy faces and a direction. That's the biggest thing, really. Mm. No, let's agree. And another just question about in Stephen McCullum says, Al, has anyone found out what Andy's cough is about? Is it a nervous tick on camera? Um, I think I think he used to have it at Celtic, some people said, uh, that I've been I've been told the reporters up there. I think because we often do the press conferences after a match, after training, I think he just destroys his voice. I think that's pretty much what he does. And then he comes in and talks to us for like half hour, forty five minutes or so. And I think it's all to do with that, to be honest. 
Okay, listen, you got Al's front of these out here, and uh, just a final one before we do crack on to this. He says, uh, Mr. and Mr. says, Does Ali City want to be a TV show movie critic? Is that what's next for Ali Gold <laughs> after Spurs retire him into the ground? Yeah, I think if I think Spurs will see me off completely, let alone retirement. I don't think there'll be anything beyond Spurs, I think it'll be gone. Um, <laughs> I do like my movies. I do like my movies. I don't think I'd, I'll ever kind of go into that sphere of work, but I do enjoy my movies. Maybe a bit of travel writing. Enjoy all that sort of stuff as well. We are loving those travel videos. I think I said to you, out, my wife made us book a, book a, a holiday on the back of one of your videos, so thank you so much for that. I won't tell the cost <laughs> what it cost me, but I will say thanks for that. Go on, Jace. I'm just going to ask Ali, which the, the clip of Nuno's press conference was, uh, was online this week. D didn't it bring back wonderful memories for you? Honestly, the flashbacks I had were horrendous watching that. Uh, at least that reporter was just getting one-word answers. I used to get told off. I was like a naughty schoolboy, wasn't I? It was just, uh, I think we see him, is it April, Spurs play Forest? Yeah, at home? Yeah. So that'll be my reunion with him. I know one of the um, former Spurs reporters, Jonathan Veal, now covers Nottingham Forest, uh, and he says it's just, it, honestly, he's just like a step back in time. He said he's a lovely guy and he will come before a press conference. He'll come out and say hello, shake your hand, make a real big fuss of you as soon as the camera turns on. No, yes, you cannot ask me that. <laughs> Goodbye. Honestly, it's just horrendous. Nine minute press conferences. Oh, man. I tell you Ali, what. Ali, what's, what's the biggest telling off you've ever had in a press conference or the biggest one you've ever seen? Um, I've, I've seen a few people get. A few managers get quite angry with, with journalists. Personally, probably Nuno just acting like a disappointed teacher is probably the worst I've got. I've had a few tellings of behind the scenes from managers uh, or their assistant coaches, but nothing major in a press conference uh, yet. I'm sure that will come. Wow. <laughs> Easy way to start. I still just think, you know, that Conte one last year, which you had you on for, and you just said afterwards when he left the room, all you guys were like, wow, did that really happen? Yeah. Right? Crazy that. Yeah. I mean, what do you think? We're, we're nearly coming up to that anniversary. Man, yeah. it moves so fast, isn't it? Crazy. Absolutely it crazy. Is. It is. God, I forgot about that. Yeah, it, that was just deep in the bowels of St Mary's, wasn't it? It was Southampton. It just, mm. oh, I've, that's probably the most... Um, entertaining, I think, press conference I've ever been in. Despite how Ange he loves his one-liners and all of that, as a journalist, to see that was just incredible. Yeah. That was the biggest meltdown I've ever seen. The crazy thing with that is, I mean, you guys hear that first and write about it first, and you relay it to us as an audience. And I said this at the time, you must know this is going to be absolute fire before Fireball when it goes out there, right? I mean, it's just crazy. Yeah, yeah and the Spurs press officer kind of came back in the room after the press conference, and he, he looked... Like, you know, the world has just suddenly fallen on his shoulders. He just knew, like, wow, there's nothing I can do about that. There's no no attempt to tell everyone in the room, oh, you know, oh, I'm sure it wasn't that bad. Is that like, he, he knew, he knew that was just, that was essentially Conte saying farewell um, in the biggest, grandest style. Yeah. Well, I mean, look, the good news is things have moved on. And it's bizarre because every time we bring you on, Al, um, it does feel Spurs are in the midst of a crisis or some drama is happening. And, I mean, look, to some degree, it's not, been a massive, I think, shock to some that we've seen this week the or well, imminent departure of Todd Klein from the football club, where it looks like Chelsea have moved to poach him. Um, again, it may bring back memories of, I think you said on your video, Al, the likes of Frank Arneson back in the day. I mean, look, it is obviously a different kind of role. I mean, there's no getting away from it in terms of what obviously Arneson did to what Todd Klein did at Spurs. But um, we understand obviously he'll now complete a guarding and leave period and then join Chelsea on the completion of that where he could be given the title of president of business, which was vacated by Tom Glick. I mean, your initial thoughts on that, Al, the fact that he departs the club and the fact that, I mean, the one area that he was meant to come into was to, of course, get those stadium naming rights, which he leaves without doing. What's your thoughts on him departing the club at this time or imminently departing the club? Yeah, it's a really interesting one. Obviously, we can't really, despite I know I did it, comparing it to Frank Arneson, more so where the destination is. But in terms of affecting the first team, yeah, Frank Arneson was a big jolt back then, suddenly going to, to the rivals. Whereas with Todd Klein, it's a really interesting one. Depending on who you speak to, you get a completely different narrative about him. Um, he was some people he was quite popular with. Um, and he did, in terms of bringing in money into the club, he played a part in the Getir deals, the Cinch deal, 
the Ineos renewal. He had a little bit to do with the the F1 drive karting thing that's underneath the whole Formula One partnership. So he did bring investment into the club and partnerships. However, he's also, I think, upset a few people in the club because he did a big revamp of his whole department and a lot of kind of long-serving people, uh, people that were very popular within the club, left. It was quite a high turnover of people. Whether it was connected or not, I don't know. But even recently, the partnerships director, Fran Jones, who a lot of us journalists kind of knew from our times on the tours, he would always sort those. He'd been at the club 21 years. He left last month as well. So there's been a lot of kind of upheaval um, in his reign. And, and, and his reign, it's like, it's like he's the king or something, in his era at Spurs. Um and there was some speculation that he might have gone anyway at the end of this season. Um, so I think there would certainly be some people within the club that won't probably be that sad to see him go. But there will be some people that feel like he had brought in a fair whack of investment into the club. He did bring some talented people into the club as well to replace those who'd left. But as you say, the big overriding thing was one of his key briefs was to come in and bring the naming rights, as he had done at the Miami Dolphins with the uh, Hard Rock Stadium. There's a little bit more to that, I would say. I think to kind of chuck that all on him is a little bit tough. You know, it's something that the club of and Daniel Levy's come out in recent last year or so and said the club have kind of lent more towards just having Tottenham Hotspur Stadium because of the massive financial benefits they've actually found from that, globalising their name in different markets. And who knows, he may well have brought potential offers to the club that they didn't meet their expectations for the um, the kind of fee they're looking for each year for that. Um, so, yeah, it's a very mixed one with him. Um, on a personal basis, met him a few times um, out on the tour of Korea a couple of years ago. He sat down with the journalist, had a bit of a chat with us for about 45 minutes to an hour. Very pleasant chap, um, American guy, very kind of confident and um yeah well spoken you can see how he's probably you know he's a bit of a salesman in terms of getting people in into um, the club and, and money and partnerships but yeah he will leave a kind of a bit of a yeah a divided um opinion in his wake i think interesting i have a jace jace how are you my man do you think Spurs will replace him? And, and are you surprised that he's gone to to chelsea and when when do you think he'll start there um, they're, they're looking to replace him. That's certainly a thing. Um, in terms of, we're not entirely sure how long the gardening leave is going to be. At the moment, that's one of those things that's like a contractual thing. So no one's really letting that out right now. I'm sure it will emerge sooner rather than later. But at the moment, that I think it was decided today. So they're kind of keeping that a bit close to everyone's chest. Um, and then Chelsea, I mean, good luck to him. I would say. Um, that's the one thing about Tottenham. Uh, whatever you want to say about the club, they're a very stable financial club and with a massive new stadium to sell, or newish, now it's five years old, isn't it, almost? You've got a lot to sell there as a, as a sales type or a partnerships head. Whereas with Chelsea, you know, we know the issues that are going on there, the financial fair play stuff they've got to do. They've also got their own stadium stuff coming up, whether they redevelop or whether they build a new stadium um or, or whether it's even in the same location so yeah like i say good luck to him. that that's a that's a huge project to take on um i guess an american going into a very american uh business right now with their owners um uh, maybe it, i don't know whether it will suit him more or less but it's a big challenge for him um and yeah and spurs will replace him i think the one thing you can you can say is that chelsea are a desperately in need of extra revenue. Yeah. You know, when you see that they're, you know, trying to sell Broyer and trying to sell Gallagher, because that's the, the homegrown jewels, if you like, to, to maximise their profits so that they can can meet the uh, the FFP on PRS or whatever it is rules. So, I mean, I'm not in the least bit surprised. They're certainly not going to have any Champions League football next year again, are they? There's, there's no way they're going to make make Champions League football. So, you know, the money that they spent and the, the need to get some back. And we still, of course, don't know what's happening with the um, with the case for them against Hazard and William and, you know, financial problems with the, the, the fact that Chelsea never paid for those transfers and things like that. So, you know, I'm not in the least bit surprised they've, they've turned to try and... I'm just checking. Jason's been cut there. <laughs> <laughs> Todd Bowley's had enough. They've cut him. <laughs> oh, Jason, put you back. 
That's, that's one line I've got hold of. <laughs> <laughs> Tom Bowley had a word and cut you there, James. You were going too far to, to the border there. Too far to the line, I tell you. I don't know what happened there, mate, but no idea. Anyway, move on. Cracks, I come over to you, my man. What do you make that news, Cracks? Surprised by the fact that we've uh, seen another one of our staff after all these years depart, potentially for Chelsea? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, a few people that I speak to, um, like, like Ali said, some people said, yeah, you know, he done this, this and this. And there was other people that... I don't think we'll be going to his leaving party, to be honest. So, uh, but I think if you're in that type of position that, that he had, I think you're always going to make some friends and some enemies within an organisation. I think that's just the nature of the role. Um, but like uh, Ali said, going to Chelsea, uh, you know, I don't want to turn this into a Chelsea thing, but... He's got he's got his work cut out there because um, you know Chelsea need to develop that stadium, which is what he's going to be brought in to do. And <clears throat> one of the biggest things that Spurs had was the logistics of things like storage, buying up extra land around the ground, which wasn't which was a logistical problem for Tottenham in in Tottenham. Now move that problem to Chelsea and trying to buy real estate around the ground and the logistics of actually storing stuff, you know, because um, that, you know, this is what comes into things like stadium development. Um, it's going to be a huge, huge problem for him. So, you know, uh, I, I wish him no luck in the world getting it over the line because it's Chelsea, but he, he, you, you really have got your problems like around the area of uh, that area of West London. So, uh, so, so, so let's see. But look, you know, it, a few times he reached out to us on the pod and was, look, you know, spoke to us and said that he enjoyed what we put out as a podcast and that. So he seemed a pretty affable chap, but he's gone. New man or new woman's coming in now. Um, so we'll we'll see where that takes us. But I wouldn't think that Tottenham are going to have any problems replacing him with somebody coming in because we just look such a um, rich prospect at the moment for somebody to come in and an exciting project, to be honest. You know, I know we all have our issues with the club, but as a, a project over overall, I mean... It must be anybody that's in that field of work that Todd Klein's in must be absolutely licking their lips to come in and get involved in, in, in that stadium and everything going on. So, yeah, I would think there would have probably been a big queue round the block of people from around the world with that sort of expertise coming in to, to, to take the job. And, you know, love or hate Daniel Levy and the board, they're no fools. They'll fill that position with somebody like very, very like probably best in class in that field. I think you could put it up, uh, cracks with regards to Todd reaching out. I mean, he's been very, very complimentary. But I would question his taste now, given he's going to Chelsea. Well, there you go. You can't have everything, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, there was a former manager that made that mistake. So let's see if that continues. Absolutely. Uh, Al, one question I do want to ask you is: I mean, again, I think it feels and you'll know better than me on this, that in the background, they've been fairly relaxed to the fact that they've not been desperately pushing the stadium naming rights. Now we had some links to Google. We've had, again, some links to some really high-profile brands out there. But I think one of the cases that obviously having the Tottenham Hotspur name, obviously throughout Europe and obviously around the world and America, that hasn't been a bad thing. So, I mean, how... It's hard to put a time scale on it, but how desperate do you feel the club are to really nail a stadium naming rights deal in the near future, do you feel? Not at all. Honestly, I don't think they're desperate at all. And I think, to be fair to Daniel Levy, he's come out and said that. I think, to begin with, there was a real fixation on it, you know, and, and we were in the media as well. And I think the fans were, you know, why hasn't this? I mean, the stadium, like I say, it's been half a decade since it opened. It was being constructed before that. Um, and I think we're at a stage now where they've seen the benefits that have come in from the name of the club being on it, especially, you know, the NFL. I mean, even down to silly little things like, American um, youngsters in America will play the Madden computer games like 
the rest of the world probably plays FIFA and stuff. And in Madden, you know, you've got Tottenham Hotspur Stadium, like it is in FIFA. And it's just the club's name is out there. That means more people know it when they want to bring in sponsorship, investment, anything like that. So it's got that element to it. And I think that kind of took them aback. I don't think they realised quite how that was going to impact them in that sense. So that's kind of made that there's no real pressure to do it. And I mean, some of the huge deals that are out there right now, there, you know, there were some big deals on, on recently constructed stadiums. Even the Staples Centre in, in LA isn't the Staples Centre. I, mean, I think it's something like the Crypto.com Arena. That is, like, I think, the biggest current deal. That's some around £550 million for like a 20-year contract, I think it is. The SoFi Stadium um, in LA as well, uh, the NFL Stadium, that's something along those figures. So Spurs are kind of quite within their rights to look for those sort of figures because, you know, whatever that is, maybe £25 million a year, something like that, because they've got one of the best stadiums in the world. So I guess if you're in a position where you don't have to rush that and take whatever you want, and you look back now... Pre-pandemic, if they'd taken one of the first offers that came in, I don't think it'd anything anywhere near reflect what they'd get in today's market or the future market for the stadium. And you know, as much as I know Spurs, like certain football fans, hate to hear this, you know, it is the place where the NFL was played. It is the place where you're getting help, uh, world heavyweight title fights. It is the place where you know Gaga, Beyonce, Pink, whoever do their concerts. It is the it's becoming the go-to place in London for all of this stuff. So it's it's an easier sell as well for a name. Well, I say easier. It's been five years now. <laughs> it should should be um, logically a, an easier sell to someone to get the kind of price they want. Um, but yeah, no desperate need to drive that through anytime soon. They'll probably announce it tomorrow now. That it's I been know. Some, uh, It'd be so Spurs, wouldn't it? The Ricky like... Norwood Arena or something, you know, with all his <laughs> extra fame on the ice now. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> you love that. No, you know, uh, Rick, I think Ali's right, you know, just if it's £25 million a year to call it whatever stadium, at the moment, calling it the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium, when you look at some of the blue chip brands that have been now associated with the club, like Beyonce, you can't, like, it's, it's baffling the worldwide reach that somebody like Beyonce has. And you only need her to mention from her own mouth that she's playing the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium. I mean, that the, the club will have a team of people that turn that sort of mention reach into a financial... Um, they will do an equation. Well, you know, just by the NFL having it associated or Beyonce associated if somebody like Taylor Swift I mean we, we we laugh at these things but Taylor Swift actually um had an effect on the American economy when she toured she actually upped the gross domestic product of the whole country so these types of brands that come in to the stadium with the stadium named after the club actually do have a financial reach. And I know it is probably a lot of fans that are curling their toes at mentions of all this, like the NFL and the racetrack and Beyonce. But, you know, if you want shiny new players to come into the club, you've got to have shiny big money to back it up. And, you know, Mate, you know, I, I still dream of the days of Johnny Pratt and Terry Naylor playing and standing on the shelf. But I also get that football's moved on. Now it's all about finance and business. And I can even see Jason wincing now up in the up, up in the top corner. But that is the realities of, fo of, of, of football today and the football industry, you know. So... Yeah, so, you know, just keeping it as a Tottenham Hotspur Stadium is probably worth more to them than the £25 million a year than to call it, you know, the Ricky Norwood Dome or something. It, it, it really, it truly is. Yeah, I'm thinking for the fear of Ricky, of Al being aggregated there for the Ricky Norwood Arena. <laughs> when you, when you went crack, I, I think Ali's right. It might be the Ricky Norwood Arena. I'm thinking, what's going on here? Go on, crack. Go on, the Dave. ones that complain most about about things like that are the ones that are always tweeting just pay whatever they want pay them whatever they want pay the club whatever they want 
if Leon won 125 million for some nondescript right back, just pay them, just pay them. The fact nobody else wants to pay more than 40 million, just pay them, just pay them. So yeah, they're the ones that yeah. will be moaning. So I'll see you down at Taylor Swift Stadium on Saturday, Jase, yeah? Where, where are you going to be sitting? Not me, mate. Not me, mate. <laughs> <laughs> you had your Bengala out in Bangkok Stadium, mate. That's, that's I'm hoping it's not raining at last. I'll tell you, Jason, on, on the point of um, just Klein going to Chelsea, you know what's interesting? I know obviously Chelsea are advancing the FA Cup as we record here. Um, you know what? Again, Chelsea, the situation that Klein's walking into there, as you guys have said, you know, you hear reports this week that Chelsea fear sacking Poch would put them in breach of financial restrictions. It would take them more than 10 million to dismiss him and his staff. I mean, like the guys have touched upon there, Klein, he's going into a really, really difficult nature of a job there. When in comparison to Tottenham financially, you are going from one degree to complete another, right, Jase? And instead of a club like you, he's got a club like Astrid Wett and Rory Jennings to, oh. to look after. So that's even worse for him, isn't it? He's unbelievable, this guy. Isn't he? He's unbelievable, this guy. What are you doing to us? You're bringing down the mood here. Look, what we are going to do, we are going to go for our first break of the show for our listeners and audio. There's over a thousand plus of you watching us live, as always. Thanks so much for all your support for last one on Spurs. I'm joined by Jason McGovern. I'm joined by Richard Cracknell. Bless him. I tell you, Crackers over there on the mobile. Um, again, I'll just repeat this. We've lost Ricky J. Norwood to the ice. Not literally. He's not in the ice, but um, he's got an extra session going on where we've lost Ricky. And Maka has been beaten by the traffic. It is the last one on Spurs. You never know what's coming your way. And we're joined by, look, we have gone goal. We've got Alistair Gold back here on last one on Spurs. Always a pleasure. Now, I'm going to bring it on to Jason's favourite subject. Yes. One that you never see Jason around in January for. Nor Ali on this show, might I actually say. Because we always get <laughs> Ali on afterwards. And that's the January window. Bit of a roundup. I mean, look, interestingly, our Spurs were one of, if not the busiest uh, Premier League club during January. Where many stood still, spurred. Spurs sprung into action. Uh, Timo Werner, of course, the first over the line for Tottenham on a loan from RB Leipzig until the end of the season with the option, of course, of a perm. That was then followed up by Radu Dragashin, where Spurs had a fight to get him over the line, but they did manage that despite Bayern Munich's claws towards the end of that deal. And then, of course, on that final day of the window, Spurs announced the signing of Swedish youngster Lugus Bergvall. And you can tell me if I've got that pronunciation right or if that's something we'll have to learn together in these next however many months we've got until he comes. But um, thoughts overall well on the incomings of the window for you? Yeah, good. I, I think, um, I mean, just getting everything done early, the main kind of priority signings of, of Werner and Dragashin, that was what he asked for. Um, and, you, you you know, if you can back your manager in terms of getting what he wants through the door um, as early as you can, help them settle, get them involved. You know, Werner's, what, two or three assists already. He's already played his part. Dragashin will. Um, he needs this kind of settling in time as well. So those were two big signings. And for me, it was just the fact that the amount of outgoings was incredible. You know, all of the talk, uh, this expression that people always come out with, or certain fans, the deadwood, get the deadwood out and all this sort of stuff. If, you, if that, that's what you're after, that's what that window was. My goodness, you know, uh, Gesty and I on our website, we, we do a, like a loan roundup each week. Is now 13 players out on loan. It's incredible um, how many they've played. And, and a lot of those, you know, or, or a chunk of those, especially the high earners, are not going to be there next season. You know, the likes of Eric Dye and even Perisic, mm. they're loans that will become permanent deals for them. Um, so, yeah, I think Spurs, you know, we talk about the revenue they were bringing in, and I think that helped them move swiftly and decisively early in the window when other clubs were hamstrung by... Sorry, I don't want to use the word hamstrings or hamstrung right now. Um, but, you know, they were a club that weren't restricted like every a lot of the other clubs. Um, and to get two first-team signings in through the door, I don't think many other clubs did that, if any, mm, actually yeah. get two potential starters in through the door. And, and Lucas Bergwald, he's, um, I mean, he's a terrific talent. He's very exciting. Um, had a kind of a big long chat with uh, Peace, uh, Peter Kisfaludi is his name. He's uh, coached him since he was nine years old and got a real kind of insight into just how amazing this young man could potentially be. You know, there's still a lot more to be done, and, and we've seen kind of some of these young talents not quite make it in the Premier League, but he's got everything going for him that he potentially can, um, and yeah, I thought it was quite a decent window. I thought. The squad looks more like a Postacoglu squad now. Um, and I think 
it's it's a it's an ongoing process, as he said. You know, probably two, three, four windows at least. It's going to need to get it to where he wants it to. But certainly, yeah, it, it feels like it's got his fingerprints all over the squad. And I think also credit where you know everyone gets very excited about Fabio Paratici and and he's the you know what's he cooking all of this stuff that people come out with all these little kind of memes and, and stuff. I think a lot of credit has to go to Johan Lang as well. Johan Lang has come in there. He's only been in since November. And the planning and preparation they did for this window was superb. You know, Postacoglu, I think, has been delighted by Johan Lang's input into the club so far. Uh, Lang brought in Werner. That was a deal that he really pushed. Bergvall is a deal that he's really worked on as well. And as soon as he came into Spurs, pushed the club that they really needed to get involved. Dragashin, yes, he's a former Paratici player, but Lang went out and watched him a fair few times in December to make sure he was also a Postacoglu player. And that was the only reason they went for him was because Lang agreed and Postacoglu agreed as well. So, yeah, that, I thought they did really good. I, I actually would say probably the best window out of any of the clubs for me in terms of what they actually got done. I totally agree. Go on, Jason, why you come in there? How's that recruitment team work? What's, what's Ange, Angie's um, relationship with Lange? Ange and Lange, what's, what's, what's the relationship between the two like? I mean, you said there, Werner was a deal that, that Lange pushed. <laughs> but at what stage would Ange have become involved and said, yeah, OK, I'll take that one? Bear in mind, it's quite a, a checkered Premier League past for him. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting because it's completely different to the summer. In the summer, with no director of football type there at all, and pretty much was at the forefront of everything, was telling him, I want that one, I want that one, can you get me that player? Whereas this one, he he took a step back, was able to focus on first team affairs, essentially. He would have certain players that he went to him that, you know, they knew he liked, uh, whether they were, you know, doable in this window or the next window, we'll see. But certainly, he, he talks to Johan Lang on a regular basis. Johan Lang is quite a quiet guy. He's not the, um, the Paratici showman type. You know, you're not going to see him taking selfies with groups of fans and then waving or on his phone or whatever. He's a very quiet chap. Um, but there's a real, from what I understand, a really good dialogue between he, him and Ange. And as with, I guess, most recruitment um, departments within any clubs, they'll drop their lists of people that they'll think fit his style. Um, and will have his ideas about players that fit his style as well. And then they come together and they decide, and ultimately, and decides. They, they, they don't go for anyone. That Andrew, and that's it's quite an interesting thing, because we would have thought that would be the case with Conte, Mourinho, but you know we saw Conte getting Jed Spence and, and Dan Juma, players that he had absolutely no interest in having whatsoever. Whereas with Ange, he's very clear on it. If you know that player doesn't come in the door unless I want him because I've got to take responsibility for that player and how he plays and everything. It's going to be on me. And he's very, very strong on that. So that's the good thing. Players that are brought to him as suggestions more than we're going to sign him get on board. I think of your daddy, Cracks, bless him. He's just um, uh, Bergvine's name. They've sold him. They've got Bergvow in now. And you've got Lange and Ange. I mean, the poor bloke. As he coping, Cracks? No, no chance. Absolutely. My, my dad and Poster Coglu, he'll just be, he'll just be Ange. He'll always be Ange. He's never having a go at Posta Coglu. He's like Alan Brazil at breakfast on Talk Sport trying to pronounce some some Greek names. It's just it's it's not gonna happen happen for him. But um no, look what um Ali was saying about this window, you can see that Premier League clubs especially have properly had their wings clipped with FFP now. It's coming there's uh, it was a little bit of a case of um, Premier League clubs being told, listen, regulate yourselves or we're going to come in with some laws and regulations that will sort you out. So, um, you know, they're, they're trying to all get their house in order before these regulations and a regulator co uh, comes in. So I think over the next two or three years we could actually be in a real good position because you know we we seem to be one of the only clubs that's actually got a few quid in our back pocket but but actually has got a few quid in their back pocket not being funded from here or they are um you know i don't want to get into the why's what and wherefores of potentially any cases coming up 
Um, Mainly because we can't afford we, it on air. <laughs> no, exactly. But we seem to be a club that genuinely now is generating their own income from all the things we spoke about before with concerts and, and you know, the go-karting tracks and all these things make good money. And the NFL, I mean, um, when we done, we done the live show from Beavertown that time, Rick, didn't we, on the NFL weekend? Yeah. And I popped over to the club shop just to have a little look round at the NFL stuff. And, I mean, if you think soccer, football is like there's a few quid in that take a look at the nfl and add three noughts onto the end of everything shirts the merchandising the money being spent and that's now coming into the club even the beer at half time um you know it, it goes up in price to what we have to pay it's a huge revenue generator and um again you know like i said before you might not like that, but that's the way football is now. So you either put your clown suit on and join the circus or, you know, just toddle off and go and follow your local non-league club because that is that is the way it is now. So, you know, next, as I say, next two or three windows, the position we've now put ourselves in financially, we could really take advantage of that. And I, I hope the club... Uh, I hope, really hope the club does and brings in those players, um, you know, that could that could take us on to 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 new and, and new and better things. So, but th this window just gone, I, I think it was terrific. Like Ali said, the players that went out, it's not really players in. If you're a player sat on a big contract and the club says we want you gone and you turn round, and a lot of them do and say, no, I'm fine here, thanks. You can just keep paying me my 80, 90, 100,000 uh, pounds a week. Thank you very much. I'm I'm in no rush to go nowhere. Well, you're not going to get any football. Don't care. That, that, that is how footballers are, because this is a two-way thing. Clubs will soon have you out the door when they want you gone. So, you know, a player's going to go, well, I'm going nowhere then, thanks. So, Probably getting rid of players is harder than bringing players in. That's a harsh reality of football now because they sit on such big contracts. And for us to be able to move on some of those players that are now surplus to requirement was was terrific business from the club, to be honest. Trimming down, getting in players that, that we want. Um, so I think over the next two or three seasons, we're in a really good position with what we can do business-wise with bringing players in. And you mentioned it, Al, didn't you there? I mean, the fact you look at those outgoings for Tottenham, Lloris leaving on a permanent, Dyer, of course, and Perisic departing, obviously, respectively as well, which will take them beyond their end of their contracts. Regulon, Spence, Tanganga, Devine, they've all returned, then gone out, of course, on loans as well. We saw Phillips, Craig, Keeley all been loaned out as well. Hello, Liz, of course, left on the final day of the window. I mean, you touched on it earlier. That has been, I think there's been some really smart loans in there in order to get players game time in which sometimes in the past, maybe there hasn't been enough due diligence done in terms of the clubs they have gone out to on loan. So just to go a bit deeper onto that, as you said, there's been some really impressive departures there, both in terms of outgoings permanently and on loans. Absolutely. I mean, you can look at the wage bill. The wage bill has been absolutely kind of just so much money has come off of that because of those more experienced players. The average age of the squad has gone down dramatically, but just by taking Lloris, Dyer and Perisic out of it as well. Um, and yeah, th there's a kind of mix of loan deals there. There's there's players that probably have no future, as well as the ones that definitely don't, you know, the Dyers and Perisic that we know are going to move on. But the likes of Regulon, probably Jed Spence. I mean, Jed Spence, they've done very well. Jed Spence, there was no interest in a deal for him whatsoever when he came back from Leeds. So to so get him involved in the Genoa deal with Dragashid, and to be fair to Jed Spence, he's doing very well at Genoa. They're very happy with him. He started terrifically. He's played on the left, he's played on the right. He's doing everything they're asking of him. Um, and yeah, they've they've got some good loans and development loans for, like you say, Alfie Devine and Ashley Phillips both doing very well at Plymouth now. Um, there's quite a few in Valise, and that was a great deal for him. Um, I, I think game time was going to be a little bit limited for him with no cup football or anything now, just these 16 or so games ahead. 
I think for him to go to Sevilla, that's a terrific move for a young player at his age. And what, did he get the number 10 shirt, I think, as well? Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, which kind of shows what they're thinking of him and his, his assurance of game time. So he'll come back next summer doing very well. And, you know, you've got the players that are already out on loan. They're like, Troy Parrott's having an amazing season here at Divisi. It's kind of gone under the radar a bit because Excelsior Rotterdam are a bit of a uh, kind of mid to lower uh, table club. But he's, you know, scoring goals, getting assists there as well. I know he was technically summer window, but a lot of their loans have been quite good this season. There's been a few that haven't worked out, but on the whole, they've done well. And, and yeah, as a January window in terms of pruning the squad while also getting effective loans for a lot of those players to either develop or move on. Yeah, I think they've done probably better than they have in most other windows. Rick, uh, can I just jump in? I think the club have actually copped on now to the fact that you have to buy the person before the player as well. I mean, you know how much I've banged on about this for the last four or five years on the show. You, there's no good buying a player if, you, if you're not getting a good person with it as well. They have to have the right character. And I think this is something that Ange has really, really got um with with the club he will it, it seems to me i don't know whether ali can flesh this out but it seems to me that he will speak to a player that might be somebody ideal as a footballer for the club but if he doesn't like them as a person they're going to get nowhere near the club and it, uh, that, that that's a that's a terrific thing to me and i think that was born out in that little video that he done with the young lad that's like, really sadly suffering with cancer and he asked him about sonny and yeah. sonny he said oh sonny seems a kind person and Ange jumped straight on that and he went you answer there you go and uh, sonny is a nice person before he's a good footballer and that's something really important to Ange. And, like, and and God bless him for that, because I oh. think that's a really important thing. Oh, man. I'll let Ali take over there on that point. Yeah, 100%. Absolutely. And then wasn't that a brilliant video? Little Freddie. Oh, that man. was such Honestly. an amazing video. Um, a... Yeah, he, he is all about the, uh, the makeup of a player, how they are, how they act, how they kind of interact with other people. I do wonder whether previous managers would take on sometimes a player that they saw as a project. It may be a bit of an ego thing, like, oh, other managers struggle with them, but I can get the best out of them. Whereas with Ange, it's very much, you've just got to be, I guess, a kind of a reflection of him. He wants his players to be like him. He likes players that have had a fight in their career. I put this to him. He's a bit of a contrarian. He'll sometimes, you put something to him and he'll say, oh, no, no, it's completely opposite. Yeah. But I've noticed that a lot of his players he signs mm. have either had a relegation They've had to go and be loaned down and work their way up the leagues. They've had maybe a bad injury or something they've had to fight back from. He loves that kind of uh, battling nature in a person. And, uh, and that reflects on their personality as well. And, and Lucas Bergwald, the, the first thing he kind of said about him was like just what a nice kid he is. What a good person. What a good family he comes from. So you're right, Crackers. It is exactly that. It's... It's finding people that he knows will fit as a unit. You're not going to get any egos, no star names that want all the headlines and everything. They're all going to interact. And that's why you've got a dressing room right now. It's probably the most harmonious dressing room they've had in years. Um, and you've got a captain, you know, obviously not right now because he's just gone out of tournament, but essentially his kind of trademark is of being this smiling, happy guy, Sonny. And he does that with the club. and the, Like even Lucas Bergvall. Lucas Bergwald just signed his contract. He got a text from Sonny saying, welcome to the club. Sonny was at the Asian Cup. So you know, that, that's what this squad's like right now. It, they've got yeah. everyone kind of feeling together and anyone that comes into it immediately feels part of it. You know, Timo Werner's come from a Premier League experience before that, let's be honest, wasn't the greatest for him. Um, he's come into Spurs and they've made him feel special. They've made him feel like he can put that behind him in his past. And I think it goes back to exactly what you're saying is it's picking the right people as well as the right players for this team. You know what, Jace, isn't it so nice to see such a likeable squad? I won't take you back with a conversation we used to have about certain players. I know he's coming. I know you want to bring him up. <laughs> he has been on here enough times I know you're going to bring up. Don't do it. Don't do it. Is it not for Tongi then? <laughs> <laughs> not again. Apparently, Sonny in the, the, the Uber Just Eats 
number in Istanbul. <laughs> oh, man alive. He has to go there. Do you know what laugh was? you know in the pre-season he went to what, what, What's happening? Here? Actually, what's happening? Here? Are you getting a job at Galatasaray? Because there's Sanchez, there's Tongi there, there's... Um, <laughs> Oria. Going for Oria. Christian Eriksen. Yeah, yeah, Oria is there. There's five, five of them. There's five Top. of them at the moment. There's a five of them. Great chance. Setting your left back next season in Turkey. <laughs> <laughs> There's a Tottenham contingent there, right? I mean, now is that making it easier for your loan run up? So you've got four or five there. I mean, I don't know if one of them's a, a, a part of the club, but um, I mean, in Dombele, for example, it's just such a shame it hasn't worked out for him. I know, again, we said that point, Jace, in the summer, me and you said this, that um, this is now the seventh opportunity that guy's getting another chance. <laughs> I know, I know. Oh. It's, it's, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, it's all down to Tongi, isn't it? Really, he, he's he's the one that's got his guide his career and where it's going to go. But yeah, I mean, he's he's getting like two minutes, three minutes a game at the moment. That's all he's getting for them. Can I ask you about? It's a shame. I mean, seriously, yeah. it's a shame because the the talent in him. I mean, when when Gareth Bale said that that thing, the, the most talented player at the club is Tongi, and mm. I said it at the time, or the first couple of years of it, he was the player that we most needed. You know, he was the player that should have been the, the Moussa Dembele, should have been able to bring the ball off the back four, drive through midfield with it. We've since had to sign Bissouma. You know, Pap Sars, one of those types of players. But Tongi was everything that we needed as the player profile. And yet, you know, what a, what a, it's got to be come down, not being funny, it's probably got to go down as the worst Premier League signing. A club record signing that's effectively not wanting to be there by the looks of it from day one, has contributed, what, a no-look goal at Wickham in a cup tie. You know, and, and that's it. And scored against Villa on the opening day. It's it's shocking, really, what, what's happened with that deal. And um, I think that that's what scarred Daniel Levy a lot. And it's what I've always said, when people, when you just see a name come up and it's pay whatever they want, well, Daniel paid whatever Leon wanted, effectively. And look what, what's happened. And I know... They'll, they'll be, well, you, you can't use the Ndombele deal for everything. But it would leave people at that club scarred for sure of thinking, what happened there? It's, and it's it's a shocking deal for the club. And, you know, when you look at that whole window, it's just a disastrous window that set us back years, didn't it? You always said that, that 2019 winner, you take us back, Jack Clark, who looks like he's going to go on to be a very promising player, probably back in the yeah. Premier League. Yeah. Seth, bless him. I mean, I, I don't know, Al, I mean, I think you put out on the final deadline, kind of your little roundup, that, you know, uh, there might have been a little bit of interest in Seth going on loan, but obviously he's still here with the squad. I mean, are we any, none the wise of knowing how far he's away in terms of getting back into training at the moment, Seth? I mean, he's certainly, I saw he was in the, the video, I think I was just doing gym work, weren't they, this okay. week? Um, yeah. It's a difficult. I asked Andrew about him the other day. Essentially, he just had, I suppose, what you'd expect someone that's played their first game in 11 months to have. He just had some aches and pains and little kind of issues that just need dealing with. Um, it's a really difficult one because he kind of is the guy that needs a, re a run of football. But yeah. I don't think he's going to get it. That's the problem. I, I think he's just going to have to wait until the summer and, and head somewhere, whether it's loan or permanently, but he's not going to get it at Spurs right now. Mm. He's got, what, four months left? I think, yeah, 12, um, 12, 18 months. After, 18 yeah, months. I think it's 2025, I think. Yeah. And whether he's got an option in that, I don't know. He might have. That's what I mean. He's going into the last year, comes the summer, and I can't see, you know, I just can't see it. Can't see Tottenham right. offering a new deal. So it's the chance to to pay. I can, I can see him going on loan for a 12-month somewhere, and, and that's it. You just see him disappear that way. I feel really sad for him because it's just the complete opposite of Tongi. Tongi's got incredible talent, but I think, you know, as, as various coaches will say, he hasn't always fulfilled that himself. Whereas with Seth, it's just injuries. It's just that hamstring. It was the first one, really, was that one before he signed for Spurs, did it, the under-21 Euros. And from that point on, I mean, there's a big hope that this surgery has hopefully fixed that going forward, but we need to see him. Just getting him back, back out on the football pitch will do that. Yeah, I mean, uh, Brian Hill was a player that obviously remained on that final day. We understand now from what you reported and told us that he's very, very happy under Ange. And again, I'm a little bit surprised that he didn't push further to have more game time, given the lack of it so far. So I wonder your thoughts on Brian Hill. And I mean, me and we always have that joke with Cracks is on it. He needs to get on the Wagyu steaks. Um, I mean, <laughs> I don't know what your thoughts are on, on Brian Hill. I mean, any chance of that player fulfilling some potential at Tottenham or unsure as things stand for you? Uh 
I, personally, I don't think he's going to be a play for the future for Spurs, which is sad because he's a very talented young man. He really is. Yeah. I yeah. still and will always until, like you say, it gets the stakes down and whether he's going to be physically able to handle this league on a kind of a constant basis. Uh, look, there's that been other kind of smaller in stature players like some Modric, obviously quite famously yeah, yeah. at Spurs, was, was a massive success. Yeah. And obviously he's not done too badly for himself since leaving Spurs. But with Brian Hill, yeah, it's... He just it just gets knocked off the ball so easily when he's in challenges and things like that. And I was very I was surprised because there, there was a you know there was an option there to go to Brighton, um, didn't take it. He's just very he loves the style of football Postecoglou plays. I think you can't probably um, underestimate how settled he is within this group of the Spanish speaking players that they've got there. It's a real kind of. A uh, friendly little group, let's put it that. I think they do everything together. Even like today, they had a day off, and I think he and Pedro Porro were in Canary Wharf playing paddle, the sport, together. You know, they're all very, very tight knit. Um, and I think for him, it's uh, a case, a bit like says, get to the summer, see what the options are then. But I just have this feeling there's so many people in front of him at Spurs right now. And whether, you know, Ange truly trusts him, I don't know. You know what is interesting now? Pierre Hoybier. I'm just trying to find because Anthony Costa, bless him, sent a screenshot to our last one on Spurs group um, on the fact that when Pierre starts in comparison to when he comes on, there's a real difference in percentage in terms of Spurs winning and not winning games. But firstly, any surprise from you that he didn't move on this window? I just feel Spurs, it appears they want to generate an amount that really they're not going to probably get in January. Is that the feeling you got in terms of the potential of the player going? What was your vibe about him staying and not moving this window? Yeah, I mean, I think Ange likes him. Uh, I don't think he's got any kind of issues about him at all, being in and around his squad. And, and he's he's a professional. He's not the kind of guy that's absolutely going to kick up a stink if he's not playing, anything like that. He, he's, he's, a, he's a good guy in that respect. I think Spurs, I think they're looking for around 20 million for him was the kind of figure they're looking for. And I think the clubs that were interested in him were not probably going to make that... Um, you know, that kind of statement on him, especially as, you know, as we we're saying, a lot of clubs it's across the world as well are having these issues right now in balancing their books and everything. And yeah, there was never really a sense that from pretty much as soon as the window opened that he was definitely going to head out the door. Um, I do agree with the, I think he's better coming off the bench than when he starts for Spurs nowadays. Um, someone made the great kind of comment. I can't remember if it was on social media or under one of my videos. He's a little bit like the guy in, like Harvey Keitel in, in Pulp Fiction. He's the, he's the guy that you send in to clean up stuff after it's gone wrong. And he's exactly like that. You take him off the bench and he does a really good role within a game and sorting things out and fixing it. But if you put him in from the start, you kind of, it doesn't play to his strengths in the Postagoglu system, I don't think at all. Um, and I do wonder if. Basuma can get back, get fully fit, get sharp again with Benton Kerr, Madison and Saar. I don't see Hoiber even getting in, you know, anywhere near this kind of starting lineup for a while, as long as there's no more injuries, which is Spurs, so it could well be. Um, I think, again, another one. It's, we talk about this January window. I think this summer one's going to be quite a busy one in terms of a few players that have kind of been in and around the club for a while heading off and, and some new faces continuing this revamp of the squad. And Hoybier, I think, will be one of them. Mm, it's interesting. Go on, Cracks. I'm going to see you biting to come in there. Mr. Wolf, that was That's in, uh, in Pulp, Pulp Fiction. Harvey Keitel, wasn't it? Or the Dustman, as we called him. So, <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, I think you're right with uh, Hoybier. I think he might be a little bit Stefan Freund, to be honest. But somebody that gives you everything they've got, but everything they've got not quite being enough. And I'll never, ever diss a player that's giving you everything, even if that isn't enough, because you can't ask any more than that, can you, from from somebody. If they come in and they give you everything, you can't get no more from them, can you? But sometimes you, you just you do fall a little bit short and... Uh, I think he has his limitations. I think Ali's right. Coming off the bench that last 20 minutes, he can come and shore things up. But, you, you know, stats and stats and uh, and that's that. You know, that, that's that. I think it's something 
it's crazy, and it Rick, it's about seventy five percent, isn't it, when he starts? Thirteen percent win rate when he wow. starts compared to seventy two percent when he doesn't. That's crazy, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, that is crazy. Yeah. That's that that is quite damning, yeah. Even yeah. if you allow for a few whys, what's and wherefores within stats, because they don't always tell you a full story. Yeah. That's is that, that you know, that that stat slews in exactly. that in that percentage, mm. you know, is telling is telling its own story, isn't it? Yeah, that's I think in fairness, you, you could partly say he started games once we started getting big injuries. So, you know, when Van de Ven was missing and Madison was missing and this one was missing and Benton Kerr at that stage wasn't fit and, and you know, we had Davis and, and Emerson Royal at centre-back. Well, you know, it's I don't think you can just pin that on and, and just use taking that in isolation and just say, there you go, when Pierre plays, look, we've only got a you know, got a 60% less chance. I mean, <clears throat> you know, he, he started the game... I just think that's that's a little bit uh, unfair on him to to just chuck that stat at him. In fairness, I'll let you take it with Costa, Jase. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I'm really arguing about Spursy stuff. Oh, don't even get me going on that stuff. Don't get me going. You'll be hours in that group, right? What we are going to do? We are going to go for our next break of the show. For our listeners and all, there's about fifteen hundred plus of you here watching us live on this last one on Spurs. Again, thank you so much for all your incredible support for the show. We are battling live football where it looks like Maurizio is going to keep his job for now. Chelsea advancing in the FA Cup. For those that wanted to know that, it's not last one on Chelsea just yet. I'm joined by Jason McGovern. I'm joined by Richard Cracknell. I'm joined by, look, Annie Gold. We have gone gold, a reminder, just for those that are asking, where is Ricky? Where is Maka? Maka beaten by the traffic. Ricky on the ice. Again, not literally just on a late routine. Right, we're going to speed things up in Jason's favourite player that never actually joined in Adama Traore. I won't ask Annie to do the analogy again of what it was like when we were going to sign Adama. Do you remember that, Al? That, that analogy you told us about us potentially signing him? Can't even get a game for Fulham, Annie. Can't even get a game for Fulham. You don't remember the analogy? About, well, about the fact that it was along the lines of the fact that you know you get all excited and right into the end of the end product, you think, oh, uh, uh, yeah. takes, takes, takes the hood off. Yes, yeah, like a screen movie or something. Yeah, that was That's it. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is the first winner. Adama Troy's not come up for Tottenham or the last couple. It tells you how far we've moved on, right? I tell you, we've moved on from Adama. Yes. Um, Spurs' his current form. We're going to try and tie this in with some of the players and are looking to head to Brighton. Um, obviously, you know what? Going into Everton, there was such a feel good factor and vibe out that, of course, rubbed off from the end of the January window that. Um, I think going into Goodison, although Everton are in a bit of a false position where if you consider the 10-point deduction, take that off. They'd probably be mid-table, as you and Guesty, I'm sure. Well, you know, we always hear the fact that you always uh, mention this fact with him. And it was the Rob Guest derby, which he was in attendance for as well, for those that listened to the Golden Guest pod. He was enjoying it off on a break um, in terms of not being on air. That, you know, a game where Spurs, of course, they obviously led twice, didn't get over the line in a real frustrating game where, again, there is this narrative around the fact that Spurs are giving away some real cheap late goals. I know, Jason, you argued the fact with me on the weekend that not all those goals have led to games that Spurs have lost. They've been well, goals conceded that have come not really at a point where they've cost us points. Jason, do you want to come back on that point? Well, I, I just think, you know, nobody was happy with it because it's no. two points down the drain. And and it's oh it's it's so spursy to concede these goals late. The the eight goals we've conceded have cost us five points because we were five one up at Burnley when we conceded. We were two one down to Chelsea with nine men when we conceded two of them. So you know they haven't all cost us, and we've actually picked up six points in injury time goals ourselves. But mm. the, the thing is, it's it's so spursy that we've dropped these five points. And apparently, I'm told, you can't win the league or do anything if you concede these goals. But Manchester City have dropped six points with injury time goals, more than Tottenham. So is it Spursy or is it actually Mankey? Because they've <laughs> conceded more than us. And, and this is what gets me with this Spursy narrative that, that you know, it, it's so Spursy to get a result and then you lose the next game. And West Ham go to win at Arsenal win. And West Ham go to Tottenham and win, and they lose five 0 to Fulham. But it's not Hammy, you know. <laughs> you you can't 
it's so spursy. You can't get a result when we really need one to go top. Yeah, Aston Villa, who beat Manchester City, Tottenham and Arsenal in three successive games, then can't beat Sheffield United at home to go top. But it's not Asti, is it? But all this Spursy crap that gets thrown at us when actually Spurs do exactly what 91 other teams do in the league. But it's always thrown at us that it's Spursy. And as I say, Manchester City have dropped more points than Tottenham in injury time this season than we have. Mm. I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a request, Jase, coming through. Can we stop mentioning Hammies, given the situation Spurs have been in this season? Um, <laughs> all I would say is I, I would take being a bit manky for a little bit, bearing in mind what they've been cleaning up over exactly. the last few years. I mean... Yeah. You, can't, you can't win anything if you concede in injury time. But Manchester City are going to win the league again, aren't they? Having conceded all those injury time goals. <laughs> uh, what are you making out of the current form at the moment? These obviously, I mean, I know Jace plays down, of course, a bit the late goals there. But um, what I would say is that Spurs in the late equaliser that has nearly happened in three of their last four wins. We can't get away from that, right, Al? Yeah, I mean, I, th- I do think people are going a little bit overboard on the form right now in terms of. They've lost five games all season in the Premier League. Five out of 23 games. It's like, I really don't think, you know, some people kind of almost making out there's a mini crisis right now. You know, they haven't really kind of lost that many games. You know, it's more these little draws, I think, that are probably kind of annoying people. But I do think, I think the clean sheets is definitely an issue. I think that is something that needs to be sorted. You know, there's been so few. Vicario... You know, talking about five losses, he's also only had five clean sheets this season in the Premier yeah, League. Great, great um, I think he's only had one since October. I think it was the Forest game um, as well in the Premier League. So that's got to be fixed. I think I agree with a lot of what Jason is saying about how a lot of teams are conceding late on. I absolutely understand that. But I would say, obviously, you know, Spurs having conceded more goals after the 90th minute than any other team, and it's the most at this point in the season that I think they've had it in the Premier League these eight uh, late goals. So it is It is an attention thing. It is a concentration thing. I do think it's something that Postcoglu won't be ecstatic about and he'll want to kind of try and get out of the game. I'd absolutely take the point the number of them were when they were kind of leading in games. But also, that's also really annoying for a defence that is trying to get clean sheets and is trying to build its, um, I guess, its unity, its straight, uh, shape, its structure, whatever you want to say. So, yeah, I would say... For a team in transition right now, a team that is being built kind of before our eyes, that has had a mishmash of players, we've got the midfield at the moment is very much a midfield on its way back. With Benson Kerr and Madison very much trying to find their sharpness and their rhythm. It's got Pat Matasar. We're going to have Basuma trying to come back to some form of fitness as well. Um, and when your engine room isn't quite right, you're going to see a knock-on effect to the front and the service to the forwards. You're going to see a knock-on effect in the shielding of the defence and helping them as well. I just don't think, as a team that's in transition, that's being built, they're doing that badly at all. Um, but, yeah, I, I don't know. Maybe I'm just kind of in the minority. No, I mean, again, I don't have a crack you want to weigh in there. I mean, I think you've also been fairly complimentary of the fact that we've had to battle through a number of, of course, not only injuries, suspensions, international absentees. I mean, how are you finding things at the moment, cracks, for you? Yeah, I mean, you know, with this, with, with um, Vicario and his clean sheets, you have to, uh, coming from the goalkeepers' union, how many has actually been down to him? Because if you can see the goal... That's 10 players in front of you failing to do their job. That's always that, 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 that's the truth of a goalkeeper. Um, and apart from maybe that one versus Everton, where he m- could have been a bit stronger, and that's something he's going to have to look at going forward. I'm struggling to think of a goal this season that's actually been down to Vicario dropping uh, drop, drop in a, a, a ricket, if you like. So th- this has all been down to defensive mistakes. I think Tottenham, the, the two biggest issues they've got at the moment is probably wising up a bit when they're in a position like they was versus Everton um, last weekend um, and seeing games out. And probably with their midfield weighing in with some more goals. We need to see a little bit more from Kulu, a little bit more from Benton Kerr once he's back, Madison, 
that you know you you've got to uh, i was saying before that under the ferguson man united teams they always had their midfield that little three or four but sitting midfield weighing in with some unbelievably important goals where skulls yeah. would nip in with one Keane would pop up and get one Beckham would pop up and get one that just gets you over the line. So I think that's probably two of the biggest issues at the moment is just wising up and just getting that midfield to chip in with a few more here and there. And, you know, like, like take take the Everton game. Um, if we see that out 2-1, then we're also right in it as in this conversation yeah. For, for, for the league. I mean, it was the, the coverage Spurs have been getting in, in with regards to this title race versus Arsenal is night and day. But the, the, the fact is, we're really not that far off of them at all. Really not in the terms of points that, no. we, that we've got and how far we are into this Postacoglu uh, project. So, um, but these are all fixable things at the moment you know there's no glaring problems where you look at it and you go i'm not really sure how we fix that you know th th these little things managing our games and and the midfield are uh, chipping in with some goals are all things that once benton Cur and madison is that is literally a new uh co combo so they're 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 beginning to find their feet with how they play with each other because they haven't you know, was it I think it was this game or the game before was it the Brentford game I think it was the first time that they played together and we saw it with Sonny and Richie where they just kept running across each other for fulfilling each other's roles so and that's something that began to settle down. And they got a bit of an understanding. So partnerships in midfield, partnerships up front, partnerships in defence, they'll find their level. They'll, they'll work out, you know, you go, I stay. I stay, you go. This, this will come. So there's not big, big problems that need to be addressed. But it is just the little things that need ironing out at the moment at Spurs. And, and if we get that right, then we're really in with a shout of, of doing something. Oh, just on that case, in terms of problems, and there hasn't been many, and I mean, I think it's fair to say at the moment, Vicario is currently going for his biggest test as Spurs' his goalkeeper at the moment. If I show you a couple of steals here from that Everton game that we were discussing over the weekend, obviously, clubs, teams have caught on to the fact since that Man City game that pressure Vicario, he's not the strongest in a battle when it comes to been able to defend the goal. Now, there's been obviously those old age arguments that obviously where is that line with relation to the fact of how far can you push it when it comes to the goalkeeper? Because for what it has been like the last two, three years, it feels like the referees have always played towards a goalkeeper's advantage. But it feels like in these last few weeks, Spurs aren't really getting those decisions. I personally, for me, like, I don't think now on reflection, these haven't been fouls in my opinion. I think clubs have taken it right to that very line. And Vicario could have been stronger in a couple of those incidents. So where do you see it for you in terms of the pressure on Vicario now in goal? Because clubs are going to keep on doing this, right? Until Spurs find that solution. Yeah, absolutely. They're going to target it. Of course they are. Any little weakness that a team can see in their analysis that they'll go for that. And, and Everton, they lob that ball right under the crossbar every moment they could, whether it be a set piece, whether it be a cross. Ashley Young was putting loads of crosses into there. Uh, what I would say, in, in terms of the kind of the, the, the foul element of it, I didn't think the Diaz one against City was so much. I feel the Harrison one, I felt was a better case for it, but obviously they never came to be. I felt with at least Diaz, you could argue he was trying to head the ball. His eyes were kind of on that, whereas with Harrison... It was just a pure attempt to kind of knock away Vicario's legs as he was about to jump. My biggest thing about it, though, is, is more than just Vicario. It's why hasn't he got someone protecting him? Why hasn't he got a minder type? Why isn't maybe Romero as the captain on the pitch right now? Why isn't he saying either myself or someone else? Let's get in between him. 
let, let's disrupt the disruptor. Let's stop the Harrisons and Diaz's kind of trying to muck him around and put him off what he's trying to do. If you can see a teammate that they are is who is being targeted, get in there and sort it out yourself, kind of thing. Um, and that's what I'd like to see. And I'd imagine, you know, Matt Wells is is certainly in charge of the defensive side of the game. Mila Yedinak with defensive set pieces. I would imagine between the two of them, you should see someone sign being designated to actually help Vicario out. Yeah, he's got to get a little bit stronger. That's part of the adaptation period of a Premier League goalkeeper. It's very different to, you know, in uh, Serie A. You, you, you definitely get balls into the box, but not with the kind of same physicality and frequency you do in the Premier League. And he's going to have to get that little bit stronger and more kind of wiser about what's going to happen to him. Um, but yeah, I don't see why the defence aren't helping him out there. It feels too zonal at times rather than actually looking to help him. You made this point, Jace, on the show at the weekend that your element to it wasn't, correct me if I'm wrong here, you're saying, Jace, that maybe Vicaro doesn't want anyone around him in the goal, in the area, right? That's your feeling, Jace. Yeah, I think probably you'd have to look back at every corner we face this season. And as I said, it's only become a problem since Manchester City. So if we've defended that way between August and the middle of January, and it's not been a problem, it would suggest that Vicario was quite happy with the way things were going and, and he wants a clear path to the ball. He doesn't want two or three, because as soon as you bring Romero in, then that attracts another body from the opposition and suddenly there's two there with, with one Spurs defender. Then he's got to come past three people and, and see how often he's come and, and got his fingers or got a punch and things and clear. So I think it's just a question of, you know, the two things have happened really quickly. Like, go back and look at every single corner we've had against us this season and see what the position's been before you, you can overreact to something. But I, like Ali says, it wouldn't surprise me if Tottenham do do something. And I think maybe a little bit as well that <clears throat> with the way that VAR is, it wouldn't surprise me if also... Vicario's taken the, or Tottenham and Vicario have taken the opinion, look, keep coming for the ball, keep being clear to do it. And if there's a problem, the, 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 you know, we'll end up getting it blocked off as a foul or it'll get referred to VAR. And, and he's almost as if he's played for the foul more than actually tried to get to the ball a couple of times. So I, I think it's just a, a general thing that they'll look at. And I don't think it's going to be a big problem going forward, but for sure, Teams like West Ham and that will target that. But then West Ham will target corners and they like to put four people under the crossbar and they, they just, you know, that's that's how they do it. So there'll be different teams that will look to different strengths, that's for sure. But I, I don't think it's as big a problem as others have suggested this week. You, you know what, Al, I just wonder, you know, after that Chelsea game, you was in that post-match presser where Rand was very much about the fact, look, we need to respect referees. You know, they've got a difficult job as it is. I just wonder whether... He's regretting maybe going so far on board with the refs that now we're in the situation where when he does criticise referee, he's now being seen as a bit of a hypocrite, right? I mean, do you feel he was only was it was he a bit again looking and it's only very well looking in hindsight now, but was it OTT to go so and protection of referees where maybe I don't know whether again maybe some fans feel this that maybe since that Chelsea game that maybe decisions haven't really gone Spurs' way, which I argue you could say have been a 50 50 toss of a corner. I can see Jason shaking his head there. Do you have a, a feeling on that, Al, for you? Um, I wouldn't say he's going out and protecting referees. I just don't generally think he cares. I don't think he wants to get involved in this whole debate around VAR and referees and things like that. I think he just is a very much a guy of what happens, happens on the pitch. And whatever you're right. doing around the game, you should be winning matches yourself, regardless right. yeah. of what, what yeah. the decisions are on the pitch. That's always been the way he is. And yeah, he was quite kind of, even after the City game, he was quite kind of flippant about it. He, when he was asked about the, he's like, what does it matter what I think? Who cares? You know, it doesn't matter. It, it, the game's gone. It's... Oh, we've got oh. Al back. Um, we've got him. <laughs> we've got you, Al. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't think it's uh, it's something that really kind of crosses his radars, uh, whether he's protecting them, whether he's criticised them. I think he just lets them crack on and, and just play your game around it. Um, he doesn't like VAR. You know, he's made that clear. Um, but yeah, no, I don't think he's gone too OTT in the other direction. I don't know whether I kind of buy all this of whether certain clubs get certain uh, special attention because they moan about things more than anyone else. I don't think that's really the case. I think otherwise, VAR would look even more ridiculous than it does already. Yeah. Um, so yeah, no, I, I don't think it's it's high on Angie's agenda anyway. 
and a quick word if I can, Al, on Mickey Van der Ven. You had the pleasure of interviewing him after that Goodison Park result. And I've got to say, that guy's maturity, which I know you're going to probably talk about anyway here, I mean, that is a guy not only plays beyond his years, but even talks about it. I just love the way that after the game, he said, look, we've got to be winning that game. You know, two and up, seeing the final minutes out, absolutely crucial. I mean, what a player he has been again. And to come back from injury and be this good, given the fact he's only just coming back. I mean, thoughts on Mickey and what was that like to interview him for you? Yeah, he's fantastic. He's, uh, yeah, 22 years old. He speaks like he's a 32-year-old. You know, he's just got so, uh, so much wisdom kind of beyond his years. He's a big lad as well. I don't think you kind of uh, realise that until I'm standing right in front of him, just how tall he is. Um, and his pace is just remarkable. I saw that stat today, isn't it? Isn't he the fastest player in is it yeah. Premier League history or something? Mm. Uh, just incredible. Crazy, crazy. Uh, yeah, he's... I, for me, I think he's Spurs' best defender right now. I think he's just... He honestly has been so consistent. And to come back from that period of time out and look like he's never been away is just remarkable. Um, he, yeah, he was angry after the game. He admitted he hadn't spoken to a soul in that dressing room. He was furious. He kind of went a little bit against or, or said the opposite to what um, Postacoglu said, because I asked Postacoglu about the set pieces. Uh, and he said, because I said, essentially, you know, you're a bit disappointed to concede from two set pieces when you know Everton are going to bring in set pieces and that's going to be their thing. And he was like, well, no, because they put in about 30 set pieces and only scored from two of them. Whereas Mickey, after the game, was completely opposite. He was very much like, no, that's exactly what we prepared for. And that's it's really frustrating that they scored from two set pieces. Um, he's a fantastic player, honestly. If I know we've been using hammy and hamstrings and all of that so far, but as long as his hamstrings stay fine, he is such a crucial kind of pillar of that defence and the whole system. Uh, that boy is fighting up again, I think. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that was Ange. That was Ange uh, doing that. Um, yeah, it, I, I think he's a terrific player, honestly. Um, I said this before, but he kind of strikes me as a little bit of a cross between Yan Tong and Ledley King. I think he's yeah. got kind of traits of both of those players. Yeah. Um, 22 years old, you know, get him tied down. For a long-term future, because he could be, you know, future captain as well. I think he's captain some of the previous sides he's been at, even that young. And the way he spoke to me after the game, um, everything of, of what he said was leader. You know, just screamed leader. So, um, yeah, terrific young player. Yeah, it just feels like so much of that defence now, in terms of the way Spurs play, is reliant upon him being there. I mean, look, we're yet to see Dragish. You've got this guy in reserve that really... How good is he? I mean, I know there's been some concerns a little bit in relation to when he's come on. There's been some chances that have been given away. But I think it's hard to really, you know, judge that when the guy hasn't even started a game yet for Tottenham. And look, we hope to see him in the future ones. Uh, just a quick word out. We've got to look ahead to Brighton. But Richarlison, what has that surgeon done to him? <laughs> he's a bad transformed, isn't he? I mean, look, you look at his goals at the moment and his record at the moment. You know, again, was it? Eight in the last, I mean, eight in the last eight. I mean, it's just, or maybe nine in his last eight. Just absolutely phenomenal at the moment. What do you, I mean, what do you feel you're seeing there, Richard? It's a completely different player. Is it all just down to the surgery? Is it confidence? Is it a combination of both? Yeah, all of the above. Um, you know, you can't kind of overstate having more confidence in your body as well to be able to do what you want it to do. We saw it with Sonny last season. You know, Sonny struggled because of the injury problems he was having. And I think uh, Richardson getting free of that, uh, getting into a good kind of place, uh, I think, in his head as well, and being happy and confident in what he's doing. Like you say, nine goals in uh, eight Premier League games. And, you know, I love the fact that Sonny, before he went away, said, like, you've got to step up, you've got to do this, that other players might have shrunk with that kind of being put upon them. Richardson's absolutely stepped up. He scored in every Premier League game since Sonny went away. Um, he's wow. he's just been superb for Spurs, and and I, I find it strange. Some people criticise his hold up play. I think his hold up play has been really good. I think he's battled for the ball. A lot of their attacks that they do have are because of him uh, getting the ball out wide to the flanks. His ability to play the Posta Coglu number nine role of knowing that the fullbacks or the wingers are going to cut that ball low into the box and his first time finishing. I actually thought his first finish was almost as good as the second one because of the the nature of hitting it first time when he had to. Um, yeah, he, he's been excellent and uh, yeah, long may it continue. And I think 
when that midfield clicks and when it clicks with the wingers and you get Sonny back as well, hopefully this weekend, mm. um, I think Richardson's goal output is just going to continue to increase. I wouldn't be shocked if he's uh, 20 goal uh, for this season or more, maybe even 25. You know what's funny? Again, you look at his ratio, Richardson, the nine goals in the last eight games, that's including nine coming from just 23 shots. You know, we, I think you, Jace, you always say how you know clinical Sonny is when you put him in front of goal one-on-one. One. But to be fair to Richie, that's not bad at all. When you consider, again, you look at the way he started the season and that lack of confidence. I mean, he's just a player at the moment on real prime form. I mean, given that, Al, I know, again, when you look at those stats, it's really hard for me to make a case to go out there and buy a £60 million striker. If he continues the run rate he's on, have Spurs, in your opinion, found their... Number nine, have they found that new Messiah to Harry Kane in Richie or is it still far too early to say so? Yeah, it's been a very good run. Let's see kind of how he does for the rest of the season. I think either way, you probably need another experienced number nine to give him competition. Uh, as I said earlier, we'll see what happens with uh, Alejo Villis and, and how he does at Sevilla and whether he kicks on um, and whether he's ready yet for, for that kind of role. But no, I'd imagine summer a, a striker will be kind of high up on their list, potentially maybe with a with a fullback or two as well. Um, but yeah, I think he's done terrifically. But it's uh, I think it's probably been his best goal scoring season in the Premier League for a while, if not complete. And I think it could end up being his best one since he arrived. Um, but yeah, let, let's see how he does in the next sixteen matches. Um, but I, yeah, I, I still think he'll have more competition next year. I mean, I agree. We're going to go straight to Brighton to come for Tottenham on, of course, Saturday. Um, look, Brighton, for me, it's one of those fixtures where I never feel comfortable about this game, Brighton. You just, I mean, again, we beat them last season under Stellini, um, which I think I'm right in saying, is this the, I'm sure this is the game where Stellini let all that havoc revoke from the bench. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what I loved about it is that, that that bloke was clearly just not looking what was going on. The absolute chaos cracks come over to you on that bench at a time when Stellini was almost like looking away from it and then got a red car for it saying what me what did I do I was I was away from it cracks <laughs> he did didn't he he's just yeah. absolutely nothing to the innocent bystander in it all as he just he, he just went into chaos uh, a friend of mine sits in the tunnel club behind the benches and I think Half of them got involved in it as well. I think half the tunnel club could have got sent off before Stellini, uh, <laughs> and off he went. And um, yeah, it's a, it's a funny old fixture, uh, Brian. It's one of those ones where you could get cuffed three or four nil if they fancy it, or if they don't, you could actually do them three or four nil. Uh, Brian are really sort of Jekyll and Hyde, aren't they? With 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 who who comes out so um yeah. but look you've got richie in 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 fine form at the moment and long may that continue and i think he's being managed as a brazilian player um because uh, the south american players are made of different gravy you can't manage a south american player the same as you would uh, a british or a northern european player um, you know, I've got to know Sandro uh, from doing some events with him and he's just completely cut, cut from a different cloth to anybody else I work with. Um, and where I live is a South American culture. And my, as you know, my lad plays football. So I see how the kids and their mentality and attitude is. And you've got to manage south american players in a completely different way to somebody like a van van de ven or um you know or harry kane they're just they're, they're completely different you've got you've just got to give them that that bit of confidence and at the moment richie's richie's getting that so long may that continue um i'm fully expecting son to play on saturday um He'll, he's probably back already, to be honest. That just seems to be the nature of Son. It's like, he's, you don't think, Jace? No? I think he's back uh, tomorrow. He might have flown back today, but I think he's back at the club tomorrow, yeah. We'll yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. I, I think he plays, Rick. I, I think he will. I think he's that type of nature where he'll go, right, that's over with. Now I've got duty to a club. It's duty, duty, duty with, with, with you know, Sonny. He's an utter professional. Um, 
whether he gets picked or not is a different matter, but he'll present himself as being ready to play Saturday. I, I, I think he features. So, um, yeah, we, we just got to go up there, out there Saturday, be a bit wiser than last Saturday, although it's a totally different type of game. It's a winnable game. Very, oh, very much a winnable home. game. Yeah, of course, at home. Yeah. And, uh, and <laughs> I've called Al Angie. Yeah. Al bringing you in. I'm doing roles of mercy now. I'm now asking yeah, you. <laughs> I'm, I'm doing Al now. Al, team news. Ange, team news. I'm asking Al now, team news. Um, give, us an, give us an update. And I'm doing it again here. Ange. <laughs> Al, give us an update on team news ahead of this one if you don't, if you don't think ahead of the game um, against Prime. Yeah, as Jay said, Sonny will be back uh, Hotspur way tomorrow. Um, I, I'm pretty sure he's he'll be back today in terms of in London. But uh, yeah, back at Hotspur way tomorrow. I, I don't know whether he'll start or not. I would imagine if he's even 80% fit and ready to start, then as your captain, bring him back in. And, and he probably wants to get that out of his system as well, what's happened this week to him. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I saw his Instagram post not long before we came on, and that, you know, he's just absolutely devastated by everything, kind of the way they went out. Yeah. So I'd imagine getting straight back into football is probably something he'll want. Um, I'm sure I think elsewhere, I think Basuma will certainly be in contention. He's back. Um, we've got to kind of see, obviously, the Mali coach said that he tested uh, positive for malaria early in the tournament. So we've kind of got to see any lingering kind of after effects for him and, and what that brings to him, whether you can throw him into a Premier League game with all the kind of the hustle and bustle of that for Basuma. Um, and that's kind of your key players kind of all back in there and in, in amongst it again. So uh, Brighton are going to be a, they're a strange team to play. I mean, last seven games they've scored, I think in four of them, four or more goals, mm -hmm. but then they also, you know, went to Luton and got tonked four nil as well. Um, and you've got Deserby talking about he's clearly not a happy bunny right now. He wasn't happy with the transfer window. And he's that kind of, well, as we saw in that game at the Tottenham Hotspur, he is a firecracker of a manager that can do anything yeah. in any situation. Mm. Um, yes, yeah, Stellini. I remember I was sat in my, I'd got up to my press seat a little bit earlier and just watching him come out and he just went at Stellini. Just absolutely went for him. Yeah. Stellini just didn't even know what was happening. <laughs> Um, and then obviously we saw it kind of spill into the game in the second half as well. Yeah. So, yeah, it, it could go either way. But I think this will probably be the strongest Spurs squad that Postacoglu will have had to pick from. Mm. Um, you know, it'd be the first time, yeah, I think they're pretty much all together. Um, you know, whether he's got the likes of Lo Celso and Solomon, I don't know, and, and Cess. But otherwise... Everyone that he would probably be picking in the starting eleven will be available to him, and that's going to make some really interesting decisions around the pitch as well. Yeah, I mean, again, we're getting early team news from Brighton coming through. They understand Karo Matoma is back from uh, Japan due to uh, of the Asian Cup, so he will potentially feature in this one. Uh, Simon Andringa remains at Afcon with Ivory Coast. Uh, Joel Veltman is a doubt going into this one, while Sonny March, James Milner, and Julio Incenso are injured. Jace, very quickly for you, how do you see Brighton to come? It's difficult because. You just don't know with Brighton. They, they are, I mean, they're, they're perhaps the the best team that's been promoted for 10, 15 years, the way they've just come up. And and in fairness, you know, Chrissy Hewton did a brilliant job, kept them up. And, and Potter did do a fantastic job at Brighton. They were playing some brilliant football under Graham Potter. And and then De Zerbe's just taking it on. We saw them take us to pieces, didn't we, a couple of weeks ago? Absolutely take us to pieces to find the pass that just went straight through the middle of us every single time. And they, they created so many chances that night that, that four actually flattered us. It could have been, could have been double figures that night. And yet there's, there's times where they, they do struggle. Um, you know, I, I think maybe, I think the Luton one's a little bit of a stranger. Maybe they just got a little bit complacent at Luton and Luton were what, two nil up in three minutes. I mean, that's, yeah. that's yeah. a bizarre yeah. thing to, not being funny, not being just because it's Luton. I mean, you don't expect Manchester City to be 2 0 up in three minutes against a team bottom of the league, do you? So it's 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 rather strange one that. But um I think you're right, we've got we've got pretty much now every single person back that we would want starting, as you say, people like Solomon and that would probably be on the bench anyway. So just that midfield, I wonder what it will be, whether whether Saar 
Saab, Benton Kerr, Madison will be the three, whether Hoiberg will, will miss out and that. I think it's just that getting that balance in midfield right. And then whether whether Sonny starts or comes off the bench. Um, and, and in which case, who's expense for? Whether he's, whether Kulazewski will keep his place and whether he'll end up in a front three of Richarlison, Werner and Son. I'm not sure. The, the problem is, I think we, we need that right-hand side to work. Brennan Johnson, I think, is the most naturally pacey one and the the one that they'd really want on the right, but it's it's not quite delivered what we wanted yet. Kulu, we know, is the workhorse on the right, but you perhaps miss that little bit of pace. Um, and Ver, I, I, I don't think they want to switch Son or Werner over to that hand side. So it's just interesting to see what they do with those those front three positions. But there's every chance, we, you know, it's a home game. We, we need to get back on the winning run, mate. We do. We've got a couple of quick fire final questions for Ali Bless. We've kept Renio over an hour and 40 here. We're going to go straight to predictions. Let's get Ali's one out of the way. So no one will remember Ali's prediction. So, Al, we'll start with you. No one will remember this. So, we'll start with Ali first. It might be a positive one. Who are you going for, Al? Um, I'll go for 2-1 Spurs. Yeah. John, I'm actually always going for a 2-1. It's going to be tight. I think it'll be one of those games. Again, John, we've not had too many that have allowed us to really... Be relaxed at Spurs, have we? We're not. We really, it's all been nail biters at home. That Everton one was my god. Look about that Everton game. Well, Chelsea <laughs> was. <it? laughs> I'm still getting therapy for that. The Chelsea one. Don't go through that one. I tell you. Yeah, that one was conclusive. That one was conclusive. You've seen that story before, Jay. Said that movie. Cracks. We'll go to you, my man. What are we going for prediction wise of Brighton? It will be more goals for us versus Brighton getting one because we always concede. One, but I yeah. think we've got more than one in us. Whether that's two one, three one, or even even one all, but they they, they will score. Mm. But I I think we we we've got it in our locker to get two or three there on okay. on Saturday. Fine, right, and Jace prediction for you from you. Tottenham win. Tottenham win. Okay, that's all we'll get from Jace. Right, we're going to close it on a couple of quick fire ones. Al, we've had a load come in, so I'm going to try and close it on these couple. Uh, Philly Steve says, Al, what's your take? Oh, we're going back to trophies again. <laughs> what's your take on Spurs' trophy drought? Follow our exit on the FA Cup. Should Spurs fans be having for top four, where we most likely won't win the Champions League, or maybe finishing in a Europa League or Conference League spot, as that will give us a more winnable chance of a trophy? No, I think you go for top four. I think you have to go for the top four. I mean, if you're going to look at it that way, then technically you could go out of the Champions League into Europa League next year or whatever, whatever way you want to do it. No, I think you go for the top four. Um, I think getting top four would be a nice pat on the back for everything that Postacoglu's done as well. And yeah. then Champions League football next season would be kind of just be huge for a club that, you know, we kind of sometimes gloss over it, lost their best player at the start of the oh. season. So to get back in the Champions League in the top four without, you know, Harry Kane and having to have rebuilt the squad, I, I think it'd be a massive building block. I think it would. OK. Now, Al, you have to be in for this next one because I'm a paranoid wreck at the moment until that Liverpool job gets filled. You very kindly told us a while ago, not a while ago, a couple of weeks ago, that um, just the part in the club prematurely this summer you don't think will happen with... Um, and but again, I'm, I must re-emphasize that point that in football, obviously, we know nothing can happen. But you said to us that you know the Spurs coaches as well, someone as loyal to those that want to give him a chance, and obviously that desire to succeed. He sees plenty of potential in what he can do at Spurs. Um, you still stand by that? We shouldn't have any concern at the moment. I'm just a paranoid wreck because <laughs> you know I remember all those years ago, Al, when I picked up a newspaper where it said Robbie Keane is going to Liverpool, and I thought there's no way Robbie Keane's going to go to Liverpool. He's Spurs through and through. And there he was in the Liverpool shirt in the summer. I just feel like I'm an absolute wreck until this job does get filled at Liverpool. Tell me I've still got nothing to worry about. There's no worry at Spurs. That's what I'd say. Um, okay. You know, at this moment in time, there's there's no thoughts about him kind of leaving this anytime soon. Um, he did sign a four-year deal, which I think is more than he normally, normally signs kind of rolling contracts almost or short-term deals at clubs. Definitely feels like Spurs gave him a big opportunity. Um so, yeah, I, I would be very surprised if it's probably not Alonso. I'd imagine Alonso feels like the one that's being lined up and groomed to be the next Klopp. So, uh, yeah, I, I'd hope. Uh, I mean, he was asked about it, uh, well, kind of, indirectly. Um, and he, 
again, the contrarian nature of him. If you ask him if he'll be there for a million years, he'll say, oh, I'll be there for like, you know, yeah. as long as it takes. But then if you say to him, you know, you don't stay at clubs for very long, he'll tell you the opposite. So you're probably not going to get a kind of a forthright yeah. answer out of him on that. But certainly within the club, yeah, they feel he's there for at least a foreseeable future. Shall I tell you what rattled me a little bit and what worried me is I think it was one of the quotes that you asked him and he asked back to the point. He said, look, you know, I've left jobs where I've been really, really secure and yeah. I don't really care about contracts. And I thought, alert, alert. <laughs> <laughs> but see, it's going to be Tottenham. <laughs> oh, don't, yeah, honestly. Yeah, it, it's bred into us to kind of fear uh, everything, yeah. I think. Yeah, but at the moment, no worry. OK, final question. Now, uh, uh, just, on, just on that, Rick, I don't think Liverpool will go anywhere near him. Anyway, personally, the only reason, the only reason I say I was concerned about it, the, the media might the, the media might do their thing like they do on transfer deadline when you're linked with 752 players because of Fabrizio Romano's farted and decided that that's, that's the name we're going to do. But seriously, I I don't think Liverpool will go anywhere near him. I think they'll they'll look and think, yeah, he's had a promising start to Tottenham. That's it. That's it. And, you know, from, a, from an outside, they'll think he's got knocked out the two cups early. They're fourth in the league. They look like they could get beat. They look like they might win a game. But he hasn't actually... I mean, I know he's, he's record before Tottenham is that. But I think as a, for Liverpool, I think they'll want something a little bit more concrete from what he was doing at Tottenham. Maybe if this was his second season at Tottenham and he, he got Tottenham into the Champions League and they were absolutely flying and suddenly competing for a title and that. But I think they... They won't go near him at the moment. He hasn't done as good a job at Tottenham yet to, to, for them to look and say, that's the one I want to replace Klopp with, for me. OK, Jay's fair. Look, follow up from me, Al, to close it. How far are Spurs away, in your opinion, from genuinely challenging under and next season? Or should I say this season? I don't know. Are, are we still in the race? He keeps saying, don't cut us out of it. Don't say we're not. <laughs> I saw that Opta stat today, wasn't it? 0 0.1 or 0 0.01 or something like that. Yeah, not, not this season. I think this season's about, you know, just kind of pushing and getting as high as they possibly can. Next season, it depends what the summer's like, uh, how, how much he can shape the squad. And also, as he keeps saying, it's about these young players really developing and taking on his game as well. So a lot of these young players start next season knowing exactly what is wanted from them. Um, you know, it's it's such a difficult one because we can say all we like about challenging at the top of the, the table, but Man City are just a juggernaut, aren't they? And as long as Guardiola is there, and as long as they kind of keep this model of just, it's a bit like the old Ferguson years of they don't spend a lot of money now. They just buy a certain person that just keeps strengthening them. One person, it can be each window even. They're, they're going to be up the top. They're going to be the biggest challenges. It's, it's about who kind of fills in behind them and and look, there could be a little bit of a, a kind of a gap created by Liverpool when having to be in transition themselves, perhaps. Um, but yeah, I would have thought if Spurs can get top four or five or so this season, I think they'd push on to try and be, you know, certainly in the top three next season. I think that's what he'll demand to, to be up there and challenging. So I would say next season, hopefully they'll start challenging above, whether that's for the title or whether it's just to be the best of the rest. We'll see. Al, I just love the fact having positive conversations. It's taken us six years to have you on here, but it's a nice time. We've been waiting for on for this. Um, I must say, look, absolute pleasure. Al, thank you so much. Cracks, crackers and gold, crackers and crack, crackers and crackers and gold. What are you reckon? What are you having in cracks? Could happen. Well, Rick, I'm just, uh, listen, the, the privilege to be able to speak to somebody with millions of views who Spurs <laughs> fans hang on every word of but that's enough about you, Rick. What a pleasure it was to have Ali Gold on tonight. <laughs> I knew that was coming. I knew it was going to be tired. I knew that was coming. No, brilliant. Brilliant insight. Ali, like, listen, fantastic. It, just to give us a little uh, a little bit of what you know and what you see and the eyes and ears. And um, I, I, I love Ali because he just never gets too up there, too down now just sort of takes all the emotion out of it almost and just gives you a, you know, a nice insight and a nice calm analysis on, on everything. And uh, no, it's been, a, been an honour and a pleasure to uh, share the screen with you tonight. Can I just make 
had me laugh for one second. What what made me laugh is I had to find crackers, those couple of pictures for the tweet he was putting out for when with his with his hands on his head of you. And now I had to watch back your interview when they stuffed the Conte talks up. And I thought, my <laughs> God, we've come so far in. It was about half eleven at night and I was like, it's my day off and I'm having to do another video again. I'm so fed up. I was so fed up with that video. That is probably the biggest rant I've ever. That was my Conte Southampton moment, oh, ironically. Yeah. Uh. Honestly, I didn't know that night. Everyone was like, Ali's done another video. We better watch it. What's going on? It was crazy. Jace, I'm sure you agree, mate. Always great to get Ali on. Um, and isn't it nice, great? We're getting him on when it's a bit of a positive time at the club, right, Jace? Yeah, there's, there's, there's that whole good feeling about the place. That's why I was so disappointed with. With so many people's reaction to Everton, it was as if we'd gone to Everton and lost four 0 At the end of the day, we picked up a point, wanted more, but I thought the reaction overall to Everton was was crazy. Really was. I just we should give a shout out, I think, to Cameron Yardy. What a brilliant trailer he did last night on the yeah. old Twitter feed. Absolutely superb, Cam, and he's Brother. been with us. I think Cam's been with us since day one, hasn't he, Rick? From the, yeah, the East yeah. days and things like that. Yeah, I think he was one of our listen to the Davinson Sanchez debut show, which was the last word on Spurs debut show. So, uh, yeah, fantastic work, Cameron. Keep it going. And thanks for all the support, mate. Definitely ages there, Jay. He's taking us back then. I was trying to keep that quiet. It was Davinson Sanchez's Sanchez debut. debut show, sure. yeah. Honestly, but that was, even Ali was with us then. Poor Ali's aged. We've all wasted. <laughs> so we tell you, honestly, it's been an absolute pleasure. Really, really has. Al, they love you here. They always do. Uh, for those that don't know where to find you, that's probably the stupidest thing I've ever said. Where can people find you, Al? In regards to all things Tottenham, um, I'm all, I'm all over the shop. Yeah, uh, Football London writing all of my articles and doing the podcast on there with Gold, uh, with Guesty Golden Guest Talk Tottenham, and of course to do my YouTube stuff as well. Just just to ensure I have no spare time whatsoever. <laughs> and British Gas can find you where? <laughs> <laughs> it's in the really cold house. <laughs> <laughs> What a night, I tell you. What a night we've had since coming on here. We lost Ricky to the ice, Macker in the traffic, Lily lost Ali to the boiler. It's all happened. What we are going to do, look, we I are going to... I just through the ceiling. <laughs> <laughs> you all right out there, cracks? <laughs> <laughs> For the At least I didn't fall off my chair, Rick. Oh, no, only I do that. Only I do that, I tell you. We had to do some light in the same after the back of last season. Come on. Right, listen, I've got to say, from the wonderful Jason McGovern, from the brilliant Richard Cracknell, from the superb Ali Gold, guys, you've been the last one on Spurs. We'll see you very, very soon from us all. Guys, keep safe, keep well. And as always, come on, you Spurs.